Hey everyone, welcome to the Make Money Your Honey podcast. It's Amanda Abeya, your host, founder and CEO of Make Money Your Honey, a marketing and sales training company for women, coaches, creatives, and consultants who want to triple their revenue. And we teach you how to do that by teaching a framework that covers system, influence, and sales. And I have a really special guest on the podcast today. I'm speaking with Violet the Ayala. She is the founder of Fem City. She's also kind of a big deal. Wait until I read you this bio of Violet. So you're going to be like, whoa. Um, and you're going to see why she's such a fascinating woman. So let's get into this bio first, and then we're going to go into uh, what we talked about in this episode. So Violet de Ayala is a Cuban-American serial and social entrepreneur, founder of Femme City, and the international best-selling author of The Self-Guided Guru, Life Lessons for the Everyday Human. Violet has been quoted in Success, Forbes, Entrepreneur, CNBC, Fast Company, Thrive Global, Medium, Yahoo Finance, Yahoo Small Business, Authority, Business Insider News. As a small business expert, she's also been quoted in Cosmopolitan, Shondaland, and Marie Claire. Violet has also been seen in featured campaigns and people in style and real simple magazines in addition to bare minerals women we love series she served as a part of the white house women environmental leaders program and was a commissioned keynote speaker for accenture's international women's month event the sba's regional women's conference and beckonet and luxury brand partners she's also volunteered as a program facilitator and mentor for the united way and girl scouts of south florida and she was also one of the featured as top 27 entrepreneurs for hire on Upwork 2019. She's the founder of Fem City, which has been featured in Guilt, Vogue, Forbes, AP, Mashable, and Fast Company, and has over 80 locations in the US, Canada, and the islands. Uh, Violet and Steven have three kids that span mid-20s to tween age. Their newest non-human family member, Georgie, who's super cute, is a frequent pseudo star on her Instagram. Instagram. So let me, let me get into this guys. So here's the thing. I know Violet. I've known Violet for many, many years. Um, we recently had Nikki Novo on the podcast. Go check out that episode. If you haven't about using your intuition to blow up your business. Well, I, you might remember on that podcast episode, I talked about how there was a period many years ago when I was just trying to make new friends in Miami and I was trying to find mentors. I was trying to find women who like got the, the entrepreneurial bug or the online business space or just the business space period. I'm like, who is out here? Like, I just, I just want new friends. And similar to the way that I stalked Nikki, I also stalked Violet. <laughs> and Violet, I found out, was doing um, an event about a 10 minute walk from my house. And um, I showed up. I showed up to meet Violet and Violet would soon become someone that I really looked up to in terms of building businesses. And the, the thing that was really funny back then is I remember Violet always yell, like talking about scaling businesses and scaling companies and building something you can scale. And I had no idea what the hell she was talking about. I was like, huh? What? Scaling systems, processes. What? huh? I didn't get it. I did not get it. I, I just, it was not computing. Um, so back then I was a writer in case you guys didn't know, that's what I did for, for eight years in the financial space. And like, she was always driving that point home and I, it just, it just wasn't computing. And then several years later, some of you already know the story. I transitioned out of freelance writing. I started selling digital programs where we teach marketing and sales and uh, lots of things changed. <laughs> I started making a lot more money, but I was also uh, kind of really stressed because I had not, I had not thought about the scaling thing, right? I've talked about this a lot. I've done so many episodes on how challenging scaling was for me because I just, I wasn't thinking about it from the beginning. I, I, I mean, and people were telling me, it's just, I guess I just, it wasn't, it wasn't registering for whatever reason. And I have some, some thoughts as to why that is. And I don't regret it. I actually love the eight years that I spent in finance. I think I learned a lot of really great things that, that really helped me now. Um, but one of the things that we tell our clients in Persuade to Profit, which by the way is sponsoring this episode and pretty much every episode, is um, we need to talk about scalability and sustainability from the beginning. There are way too many women business owners, myself included, I was in this camp, right, who build businesses that consume them 
right? That end up taking, the, the business ends up running them instead of them running the business. So that could look like done for you services for clients or those of you who are coaches and consultants, it looks like trading your time for money with one-on-one packages um, and things like that. So we end up doing this. And then if you end up making money doing that, which I was one of the ones who did, then you run into a problem and you're like, crap, I cannot possibly make any more money without somehow duplicating myself. I need to figure this out. And then that's that's when that scaling stuff starts coming in. So in this episode, Violet and I are going to talk about, you know, how she how she learned that lesson the hard way herself. She'd built a very popular Pilates studio. It was doing really well. She tried to sell it and no one would buy it. And she's going to ex- explain exactly why. And then we're also going to go into um, the things that you should be thinking about even from the beginning, even from the beginning of your business. What are some of the things that you need to start implementing and putting in place so you can build something that is separate from you and can that ex- and can exist without you that that's kind of the goal here that's kind of the point so rather than you our listeners having to learn the hard way like Violet did or like I did to a degree hopefully um, we're able to save you the heartache <laughs> and we're able to save you just probably hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of work. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Welcome to another episode of the Make Money Your Honey podcast. I'm thrilled because I think I have like one of my first mentors, one of my first, I think you're one of my first business mentors, Violet, coming onto the podcast today. And my have things changed since we have known (laughs) each other for both of us uh, in a way. So Violet, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom with our audience. I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about today. And I know you're just like filled with tons of stories and laughs and that they're going to love it. Oh, thank you so much, Amanda. I'm so excited and very honored to be here. And yes, we know each other for many, many, many years. And I have, by the way, I love seeing your success. I know I keep telling you that over and over again, but I have loved seeing your entire journey and how far you've come and how much further you're going to go. And just, it's just incredible to see, um, all the beauty that you bring to this world through all of the talent and just, yeah, you're just amazing. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. I receive it. Right. And we will get to some of your, the, your wisdom that actually helped with that. We'll get there when we get there. But before that, who is Violet and how did she get here? Uh, Violet is a uh, Cuban American first generation of uh, like so many of us and struggled to find her place I had my first child when I was 22 years old and didn't want to do the corporate thing. And so just started thinking about business, you know, as a Cuban American, I'm sure you can appreciate this. We grew up with lots of stories about entrepreneurship, people that made it to this country and kind of with like two pennies were able to create tremendous wealth and great businesses. And so I had that in the back of my mind. And that was the first time I started a business. I was 22 years old, had no idea what I was doing, (laughs) did like everything backwards. I actually created my first logo with a pen and paper because it was in 1994. <laughs> it was like way, way long time ago. And I grew that business. And then I went on to launch another business and then another business and scaled that business. And then, uh, you know, made great lessons and obtained a lot of wisdom along the way. And then um, started Fem City. And that's where I've been the last uh, 11 years, actually. So actually, I want to bring up that Cuban part again, because I've been getting asked recently on podcasts, like, where does your drive come from? Right. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's from knowing that things are not that great in other countries. Yeah. And the fact that we have this massive opportunity in the United States, not that the U.S. is perfect. It's not. Nothing's perfect. Right. Yeah. But I don't know. I kind of feel and I think this is because of my Cuban background. You tell me if you have had thoughts like this. I kind of feel like if I have access to the Internet and I don't find out how to get filthy rich off of it, that's my fault. That's on me. Yeah. 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 Well, because we grew up hearing the stories. I mean, everyone I knew that came from Cuba, my family included arrived with nothing, right? Nothing. They nothing. started over. They started over. So you, you have some families that, not some families, all families for the most part, no, no, no language, no culture in, in a sense of like, you know, they didn't speak English. They were not acclimated with the culture of the United States. So they had all these challenges and struggles and obstacles 
and yet they made it. And I remember being in high school and, re and recognizing that entrepreneurship was such a great avenue. One of my best friends, um, her father swam from Cuba with another guy in, in like these uh, little dome rafts. And I'm talking about 1980s. And he owned a bunch of gas stations. And her father owned a bunch of like these little um, cantinas, you know, like they would drive to the construction sites with like pastries and like little goods and sandwiches for construction workers to eat. Oh, cantinas and both... are like pre prepared meals for those who yes. don't know. Cantinas right. are like prepared meals. Okay. Like, I, like, I eat cantina every day. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was his business. He started with one yeah. truck and then two trucks and three trucks and he had 20 trucks and then three, you know, and so he, he talked about scaling. He scaled his business so that he was able to have a bunch of Cantina trucks. And then his, the other guy that swam with him and these little wraps went on to, you know, create a lot of um, franchise uh, success through gas stations. And he had them all up and down my neighborhood. Like every, every other corner had a gas station that he owned. And so you hear those stories all the time. And matter of fact, those are the only stories I heard. And it's almost like it's programming us to look at life as it is out there for our taking. Everything that we need is out there. And when we hear those stories, even today, when we hear the stories of those uh, people that started with nothing, that created tremendous wealth, that they were on welfare, or they were living, you know, paycheck to paycheck and they were struggling or they were in bankruptcy. And, and then all of a sudden they've made it through, you know, those are the stories that motivate us because everyone has somehow been there in some capacity and has struggled to make it. And we need those stories to be shared so that we can, it just helps as a navigation tool for us to, to know what, how far we can go. I want to ask a question that might trigger some people. I might piss some people off, but I would love to hear your perspective on this. Cause I know immigrants kind of talk about this a lot, right? Which is people in the United States are too damn comfortable because they don't know what it's like to have to struggle. Not everybody in the United States, lots of people in the United States know what it's like to struggle, but by general rule as a culture, right? Um, they're, they're not aware of what's going on in other countries, generally speaking, right? And, and immigrants talk about this amongst ourselves constantly, right? And they're just not aware of like what is actually available to them. It's almost like it's taken for granted. And I feel, and I've had mentors talk about this who are American, right? One's from Louisiana and one's from Tennessee. And he's like, y'all are too comfortable, right? You don't realize what you have access to. Like you don't realize that other people in other countries don't have access to what you have access to. Get off your ass and go make something of yourself. So I wonder if you've noticed that, or I don't know, I would just like to hear your thoughts. Cause I know that this is a conversation that comes up a lot in some entrepreneurial spaces. And I know it comes up a lot in like Im Im um, immigrant entrepreneurial spaces as well, where it's like, there's no awareness of what is available to us. Yeah, so I'm thinking that it could possibly be that what we all have in common is that when you are an immigrant, the stories that you're hearing, the narrative that you are acquiring from the stories being shared are of those people that arrived with nothing and achieved great success. And it, so it could be the circle of influence that's around us. You know, if yeah. you are someone who, who didn't have that in their life, like there are many people that don't know an entrepreneur. There are many people that were told to be an entrepreneur is, is a failure. It's a, it's a scary thing. You're going to fail. Yep, I mean, true. I, know, I know a lot of people that have that and, and they're scared of that because generationally they've been told that's not the way to do it. You know, it's and there's actually lots of Latinos that that's what they're told. Maybe not Cubans as much, yeah. but you know, I've been in, in panels for financial companies and things and other Latinos from other countries. That's what they're told. They're like, go get a professional job, right? right? Because that's the safe thing because there's no stability in our home country. So you're going to go to the United States and you're going to look for that American dream, middle-class stability, Right. So then going out on a limb for entrepreneurship, even though they know what's available to them, it's scary to just because they're being told, no, 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 it has to be stability. It has to be safety. Right. So, no, I, I think you're totally right. I don't think it's maybe necessarily an American thing. Right. Although some people do talk about how in the United States, we're just not aware of what we have available to us. And that's a disadvantage. Sometimes I think you're to your point, like you're totally right. Like it could totally depend because as you're saying that, yeah, I have been in conversations with Latinos from other countries and they're told a completely different story than us Cubans are told. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also that point where, you know, when you're broken, when you're at that bottom and I've been there a couple of times, that is when you find your true north. You know, that's right. when you find out. And so it could also be that if you've always been comfortable, then you've always been comfortable. You know, right. that why, why, why push the limit? You're good. 
whether rather with immigrants, you get here and you literally have nothing. So there's like, you know what? I'm going to try it. See if it sticks. You know, there's, there is no comfort. There's no comfort. And in that darkness, you find the beauty within yourself that inspires you to move, you know, keep on moving forward. So I think that that's a combination of those two is that many people are not broken. You know, they may be struggling, but they're not broken. But when you're broken, that's when you kind of, that grit, that level of grit, you acquire that and you, and you have no other option. You're at the bottom. You have no other option. You don't have a fancy degree to fall back on or, you know, a million dollars or someone to help you or, you know, contacts to fund you. I mean, when you're at that place, I think the only option truly is for many people is just to start with whatever you've got and move forward from there. And that many times has to do with, you know, creating your first business. Awesome. All right. So let's talk about businesses because I know before you created Fem City, we'll get to Fem City and what that is and how awesome it is. Um, but I know before you created Fem City, um, I think you had like personal training and coaching. You also had a Pilates studio. And one of the things I remember you saying, although it did, it, I did, it did not register back in the day, <laughs> right? Like it didn't register until I had to hit my own wall, um, was the fact that you couldn't scale it. Right. Yep. So let's talk about number one, what scalability is and number two, why it's so important. And I guess number three, how do you know whether or not you have something scalable? Yeah. And, and also that scalability doesn't have to be for everyone. I mean, there's some people that, True. you know, that lesson that I had learned, I owned a Pilates studio for about 10 years. I had one location. I started on the back of my house. You know, we bought this beautiful Victorian house and had a little studio behind it. I started having, you know, classes there. Uh, before that, I was driving to people's homes, you know, as a personal trainer, driving to their home or driving to their home to teach them Pilates. And then I started doing better financially, got my first location. I was so excited, like this little, you know, hole in the wall in the best neighborhood and grew that out of that, I grew that and then got another location that had satellite locations and then had all the teachers. And so it, it really did grow and it was scalable in some ways, right? So I was able to duplicate my efforts in more than just one way. However, when I went to sell it, I could not sell it because everything about it had the feel of violet and I didn't have a process or procedure or any streamlining. Of course, this is also 1999. So, you know, we didn't have the Zapiers and the MailChimp and all that stuff. And um, I closed, I ended up liquidating it and I felt like the biggest failure. I had, you know, run a very successful, very profitable business. How could I have not sold it? I mean, like what a failure I am that I took something that was really generating a tremendous amount of cash, had great, you know, reputation and all that. And um, no one wanted to buy it because it was, it was Violet Studio and everyone wanted Violet to be teaching the class or Violet in the studio and class was being taught. So I left that, I liquidated it, closed it down and moved back home to Miami and continuously felt like a failure, by the way. Go I'm ahead. going through that now. Right. We're like, I'm starting to hire associates. Actually, we met our associate coach through Femme City, right? Oh, yay. <laughs> so thanks. Love that. <laughs> thanks, Violet. Um, <laughs> and I'm going through that now where I'm starting to like duplicate myself and we'll go into our team meetings and we'll be like, we, I don't want to be famous. Like, I don't want this to be the Amanda show. Right. right? We got to start making the company famous, like make money your honey, the brand. That's what we need to start making famous. Right. And I'm starting to duplicate myself. And it was so funny because she started taking over this week for, for our persuade to profit training. And she's fabulous. She's so good. Like she teaches some things way better than I ever could. Right. Amazing. But there was a part of me that was kind of like, oh my God, I'm handing this off to someone else <laughs> after doing it for like four years, but I've also busted my ass the last two years creating yeah. a system that can be duplicated and that somebody else can teach. And I tell my clients that now I'm like, y'all need systems. Okay. Like yeah. take it yeah. from somebody who learned the hard way y'all need systems. Otherwise this is going to turn into a dumpster fire and then yeah. to fix it. Oh man, that is not yeah. fun. Right. So create the systems from the beginning, but it's so funny. Cause I'm literally going through that now. And I'm literally having that conversation in our team meetings, which is like, this is not the Amanda show. Yeah. Yeah, anymore. absolutely. Yeah. You know, that's, that's great. And that, and, and so when I, so all that knowledge, you know, when I started from city and I started a PR agency in between that time also, that was successful as well. And serial entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I, I can't stop. But when I started from city, that was the first thing I said, I cannot have it be the violet show. And it has to be something that lives beyond me. So when you talk about the scalability, you have so many different variations of scalability, but the one that I generally go to, and I think that you're in that place also, is that 
how do you scale a brand that can serve over a million people around the world? And if you can answer that with your process procedures or streamlining, that's when you're on a really uh, a good path to being scalable, meaning that it can duplicate itself over and over and over again, but it doesn't add to your hours. It doesn't take away from your time. It can live beyond you. You can literally step away for vacation and things will still run. Things will still be, you know, strong. Um, but I remember creating our first Fem City training module, you know, tra training manual. It wasn't even a module. It was a manual because we didn't even have the, the, uh, <laughs> the technology to create video at the time for online. We had a printed manual, Amanda, that we would give and we would fly our leaders into Miami. We would rent a conference room for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and spend the entire day training out of our training guide, like old school. And then they would, we would fly them back and that's where they would launch Fem City in their neighborhood. That's okay, how it started. Okay. So let's start giving some context. Okay, first of all, what is Fem City? So Fem City is an organization that helps women start businesses or up-level current ones. Okay, I love that. Great, right? And you're basically saying, because I think I came in before all the online stuff really existed because yes. I know a lot of stuff went virtual because of the pandemic, right? And I think I remember telling you a story um, or you saying a story where it's like, I just started like doing lunches and then everybody was like, hey, I want to get in on that. So can you share that story? Because that's a pretty good one. Sure. Actually, I'll, I'll share two stories with you. The first one is, um, yes. So we started from City Miami. I did it totally for fun. I was running my PR agency, had really great accounts, was a publicist for Earth Hour, worked with like Jimmy Buffett, Pitbull, like really cool. Loved my work there. Started from City just for fun. And my son had created an account on Facebook which was new at the time. That's how long ago this was. And I had no idea what I was working on with you know, Facebook, but I was putting our pictures up there and women were seeing our pictures and started reaching out to me to ask how they can start from city in their backyard, in their community. And I thought they were crazy because we're just simply getting together for lunch. Like it's not a big deal. Anyone can get together for lunch. You don't need me to create a lunch for you in like Louisiana. Um, and they kept asking and kept asking. So I was like, there's something here that I'm clearly not seeing because all these women are asking and we don't do anything but just have lunch together. Um, so that's really how we first started. And the reason why we started doing online, actually we started doing online in 2009, 2010 with our curriculum, because Google reached out to us at the time and they were like, hey, we wanna teach your members about Google Circle and Google Hangout. Do you remember when that was all new? Like 2009, yeah. 2010? And our members loved it so much that then Yelp came over and Yelp was like, hey, can you teach your members about Yelp? and how to get on Yelp and what to do with like bad reviews. And so Yelp was a partner of ours and our members loved it so much that we were like, well, we got to keep this going. We got to keep on doing the classes. So we've been doing online classes since like 2000, I started in 2009. I think actually those relationships were 2011, it must've been 2011 with Google and Yelp. And that's really where we started. It wasn't, it wasn't like my brainchild, like, oh my gosh, we're going to do online courses then. It was literally other people did it for us. And it was like, so well received that we just kind of kept on doing that. And that's, and then that's why we, there was, there was also the in-person stuff. So yeah. how did you, okay. So how did you actually grow this thing? Because it's, it's global. It's not just in Miami. It's not just in South Florida. It's not even just in the United States. Like this is, there are chapters in other countries, right? So can you walk us through what that process looked like? I, I mean, it sounds like you came into it already with the, the knowledge of scaling and being yeah. like, how can this thing live beyond me? So what did that process kind of look like? Because in the beginning, it's like, this was not even your brainchild, right? To go from like, not even your brainchild to starting to put this together to, we now have chapters all over the world. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll tell you the, so it was in a, we started in 2009 that fall we had a beautiful event um, in the in the grove coconut grove in miami that um near amanda and um someone came up to me and said you know what i i drive from fort lauderdale every single month and uh, for your events and it's driving me crazy you're being selfish for not launching from city in fort lauderdale and you just need to launch it and i should be your chapter uh, president there and so that literally was like how I, I was like, okay, enough's enough. Like people are starting to think I'm selfish because I keep saying no, because it's not my jam. My jam was doing PR and marketing for environmental groups. Um, but I, I was like, this, there has to be something here. So I dived in, I did a focus group to learn like what they were looking at, what made them think that. I created a manual, 
That was like literally the first thing I did. I created a manual to say, okay, what would be the steps to duplicate what we've created in Miami? Wrote down everything, like the format for the lunches, the format for like reaching out. What are the emails that we're using? What is the, you know, what is the format for, you know, the follow-up after? Like literally every single detail, I documented everything. And that, that I created the first Femme City, you know, president's guide. Uh, which then I gave to that woman in Fort Lauderdale and we launched Fort Lauderdale and that was great. It was beautiful. I really tried to step away and just have the guide be the only thing she had so that I could tell if it was really scalable or not. Of course, Fort Lauderdale was successful because we were in Miami. So that wasn't really a good test. So I put it on LinkedIn saying like, oh, you know, we're looking for people to launch from city. I just posted out there, Amanda, like, you know, like just to see what would happen. I had a lot of women reach out to us and so then we launched Philadelphia and we launched a chapter in South Texas. Again, had the manual, gave it to them, stepped away to see if they could do it on their own. And they did. And it was beautiful. And Philadelphia turned out to be, Cheyenne ended up launching from City to Philadelphia. It grew to like thousands of members. Amazing. It's still an amazing community um, even to this day. And, you know, really, I think the secret for that is I created it and I was open enough to edit the, the manual and edit the process as I saw people using it. And then if they had a question about something, I'd say, you know what, let me add that in the manual for the next revision. And so we scaled, you know, we did three and then we did 10 and then we did 15, but I always paused in between each one to make sure that first the manual was still the go-to place, that they didn't really have to talk to me too much. And also that um, it was something that was foolproof. You know, you, you want it to be completely foolproof and that our processes were also in check for that next level of growth, which is another thing that I see a lot of businesses do is that they grow too fast, too soon. And mm -hmm. when you grow too fast, too soon, you have all these things that fall through the cracks because you weren't prepared for that growth. It's almost and like- And break, yep. And break, and it breaks it down and, and then businesses close because it could only get to be so much. So it was the intentional pausing, looking at everything, reviewing, even now we're going through it. We're going through another growth. So looking at all the process and procedures, is everything in place? Is everything as streamlined as possible? How many humans are touching that? If there are five humans touching that, it's not, it's not scalable. We got to go back. How do we get it? So only two humans touch it or one human touches it or no humans. Maybe it just kind of gets completely automated, but that was really the secret to our growth and listening the entire time, listening to see how we could be two steps ahead of what our members would need before they realize they needed it. It's very mm -hmm. similar to like when you go to the Four Seasons and you're wearing black pants and you sit down to have your meal and they bring you a black napkin, right? So you they've already thought of you before you thought of yourself that if you have a white napkin, it's gonna get white lint all over your black pants. They have already thought of it so that when you enter, you're completely catered to. Same thing with Femme City is that what are, what's going to be that business trend in two months that we need to teach today so that our members have that uh, knowledge so they can use it in their brand. So that's really, you know, that staying in touch with the people you serve every moment of the day to make sure that you're evolving at the speed and always being relevant to their life. So you mentioned that you have the training guide, which I love. I spent a lot of time earlier this year creating lots of training guides and onboarding <laughs> <laughs> and videos and a whole bunch of things. I'm like, every time we do something, we must document. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, we've with words and like, video <laughs> with words and video and audio and screenshots like we got it all okay yeah. like there's no way you're not getting this <laughs> right yeah. um and now our associate coach actually one of the things she did this week I was like oh thank god right was um I mean I've been running persuade to profit for four years I think the document had gotten where that I was using to teach right because it's evolved over time I literally think it's a hundred something pages of, and it's not a brain dump. Like I understand what's there and I understand what we're teaching. And there's a portion of it that's on video. Right. But then in the live, we go deeper and we workshop people. So earlier this week, she's like, Hey, so I was going through it and I created lesson plans for it. So like when we hire people again, like this will be easy peasy. And I went to go look at these lesson plans. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever yeah. seen. <laughs> did, you, did you cry? That's a cry I almost moment. cried. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Cause I'm like, it's out of my head. Right. And, and when I hired Xenia a couple of years ago, that's what I said. I'm like, I have all this stuff in my head of what I've been doing and I need to get it 
out of my head. Like it needs to be in documents. It needs to be on videos. Other people need to understand this. So I'm geeking out right now because I've gotten really into systems when I, since yeah. I started scaling, because yeah, I'm like, yeah. you can't scale without this stuff. And I also want to acknowledge the growing too fast thing because I don't know. And I would love your opinion on this. So I've had mentors tell me you need to like really nail your marketing and your sales and like really blow that up first. And then, you know, then work on infrastructure. And I was like, I did it the other way around. Right. But it's because I had lots of friends with seven figure companies and a part-time VA and the back end was a dumpster fire and I refused to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You want my thoughts on which one I would, yes. I would say, yeah. you already, you already know what I'm going to say. So I, I, you, you have to do the infrastructure. I would say to do it in combination and then in test combination. It. Yeah. 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 And then test it and see, and, and listen to where those gaps are. I mean, if like, we just, it's funny, I had a call earlier today and that's another woman who found another community organization and we were just sharing notes and we were laughing at like, you know, some, a, a silly question we get all the time. And I got it three times and I was like, I'm not getting this question again. I'm going to create a tutorial. It's going to be a one minute tutorial. And that's the end of that. So you, know, you have to be open to listening to that feedback to see where those holes are, because you, sh- you know, we're always going to have, you know, little things that fall through as we um, up level. But if you are intentional about that, that pause, reviewing all the systems, reviewing to say, are we as good as, are we as strong as possible? Are there any holes that's going on that we need to address right now? Oh no, we're good. Really? We're so, okay. Let's go. Let's go to the next level. Let's crank it up. Yeah. That's let's how crank I feel it up. about it. And then you get to that next level and you do that same check. I mean, we do it summers and in the fall, right before the holidays, like right. It's kind of starts slowing down like mid December. That's when I go in and I look at everything. What is happening with every single item of our company? Um, and is it as strong as possible for that next level of growth? Knowing that January is our huge month. That's our huge, big, big month. And also um, September, <clears throat> those are the two biggest ones. So I want to prepare. I want to make sure that we can, can we add another hundred chapters? Is that, is that okay? Is that cool? We got, yeah, yeah, it's good. All right. Let's add a hundred chapters, but you you have to have the infrastructure in place. If not, you will, you will just flop on your face and, and it's, and it's not enjoyable. No one likes to spend really time doing infrastructure over and over again, but it's so necessary. If you do want to scale it to over a million people, it's, it's just part of it. I love that question that you ask yourself, how do we get this to a million people? Which brings me to my next question, which is where do you come up with the, this vision? Because I feel like one thing I've been working on recently as things expand, it's very interesting. And you've seen me go through this process, right? Where it's like in the beginning, it's like Amanda just needs to make money. And Amanda's a financial writer. And Amanda's gonna be a writer forever. And she does brand work <laughs> and all that stuff. And then people ask her on the side for one-on-one coaching of how like she was able to get like discover as a client, right? right? Or like how she was able to build this thing online. Right. And then it shifted. Uh, and then I started hitting those scaling problems. Where I was like, oh, wow, I can't make the what kind of money I want to make. I need to start creating systems. And it, it started with creating a system around what I teach. That was the first thing. And that was a huge light bulb moment because I made more money in two weeks than I used to make in a month Yep. because I had systematized something that yep. did not necessarily involve me so much. Um, so that was a big aha moment. And then a year and a half after that, we grow so fast because we started making so much more money since I brought that first system out that I need hired my first employee, right? Because my accountant was like, girl, you're we, a, we got to change to an S corp like now. Right. And yeah. B, you might want to hire your first employee. Um, so then when I brought her on, I was very frank with her and I was like, listen, this is a dumpster fire. I got leads coming in from everywhere, right? I know how to sell my ass off so I can get money in this door, but I need you to help me. And she's like a double Virgo. So I'm like, oh, perfect. Right. <laughs> I don't She'll even know great. what that means. But that sounds amazing. <laughs> They're very detail oriented. She'll be great at systems okay. and they love a to-do list. Right. Um, and I was like, and, and so, and I'm like, you're helping me build this thing right? Like you are helping me build it. And I was very clear with her. And then I look at where we are now and I'm like, oh shit. Okay. Well now it's not just about me. Now it's not just about my clients. Now it's about team. So like the vision just got bigger. Right. Yeah. And so, and then now I'm going through that transition again, where I'm like, okay, great. So I've got, I know how to get clients on a mission. How do I get a team on a mission? How do I even get straight on what our vision and mission is? Because this was not even an idea. 
eight years ago, right? Or nine years ago, like Persuade to Profit did not exist. Now I'm like, I want a thousand women in Persuade to Profit to teach them outbound sales because they are not getting this knowledge anywhere, right? So like, I'm fired up about it. I would rather have a million though. I kind of like that litmus test, but I'm like first target a thousand. So all of that to say, right? How do you come up with this vision? Because for me personally, it feels like it's been like, I, I, it's been this process where it went from like me trying to survive to like helping clients and then being like, Hey, I'm outward helping clients. And now like developing my team and then getting a whole group of people like toward one vision and one goal. So how do we get clear on that vision and that goal so that we can show up with our mission and scale it out to a million people, like you said? Yeah. And I love that you shared uh, that because it's really the alignment, right? So when you have that I love another question I love beyond the, you know, how do you serve a million people with the same amount of hours in your day um, is how do you, what's the biggest vision you have for the talent and skill you bring to this world? Like, what is the ultimate biggest vision that you can pump this out into, right? And, and, and listening to you, I'm going to pretend to be you. So if I was Amanda, I'd be like, okay, I have this beautiful skill and talent and wisdom and I'm sharing it and it's amazing and I'm changing people's lives. What is the ultimate, like how big could this possibly get? Like what's the biggest, biggest way I can share this with the world? Once you have that, then you make sure that all of the action steps and all the words that you're using for your team always align to that. So for ours, it's, it's to be the number one organization for women entrepreneurs around the world. That, that's literally what we want to do. We want to serve over a million women. We want to have a million women start a business. That's great. How do we do that? What's the alignment? What are those action steps? So that is your true north all the time. And you're talking about it all the time with your team. Hey, this is our vision. Remember, if we're going to be, and I'm just using you as an example, if, if you want to have your program impact a million women or more, what does that look like? How do you show up? What are those avenues that you need to take, all of you, collectively, collaboratively, to attain that. Um, so those two questions are really important and to have it always repeated over and over and over again. So it becomes your part of your DNA. You don't have to then, after a while, you don't have to share it anymore because everyone's feeling it already. And when you get closer to that, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a moment that everyone can appreciate because you're all in alignment to that true North. Does that make sense? No, I love that. That makes, that makes total sense. So I feel like you may have answered this question already, but like you have chapter leaders all over the world. How do you manage all these people or do you manage all these people? (laughs) Yeah. So we have, so we have a great team. It's not just me. We have an amazing team. Uh, We have directors and we have social media. So it's not, it's not just me at all. Um, It really comes down to the process and the procedures and the streamlining. You know, so when we add 10, 20, 30 chapters, and when we add, you know, we have 10 new partners now to onboard. So how do we do that with the same amount of hours in our day? And most of us take Fridays off. You know, that's like a, a fun city thing. Like we don't work on Fridays. And now I stopped working on Thursdays. I mean, I'm here today, but it's like not work. It's fun. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the documentation, the process, the streamlining. And again, going back to that same thing, before you up-level to that next level, and you know it's coming, you always know it's coming. You can feel it coming. You know it's around the corner. You got to prepare for it. It's like that hurricane. You know it's there. What are you going to do to prepare so that you can actually have the strength to go on to that next higher level? So it's really the team. It's the team and the process that we've put in place and uh, sticking to that and and recognizing like where are those little holes that we need to fill? I mean, there's always, like I said before, there's all these little holes, but if you're connected to that, they don't get to be huge holes. So you can just kind of like button them up along the way. I love that. All right. So how do you set goals and targets for Found City? So for example, you recently just used the example of like, all right, let's add a hundred chapters, right? So obviously you have the real big ass goal, like a, a million women, right? And becoming the number one um, you know, business development company for women in the world. But how do you set like, quarterly goals, annual goals? Like how do you break that down? Cause I feel like sometimes us entrepreneurs are really good at the big vision stuff, right? That's why we're the head of the company. Cause we're the visionary. It's what right. we do, right? We've got all the ideas, but then when it comes to actually breaking that down, right. into like, here's what we're doing this quarter. Here's what we're doing this year. Here's what we're doing this month. Here's what we're doing this week. That's where we all get tripped up because we're yeah. really good at the big picture, but not so good at the 
how do we bring this down into something more methodical and digestible? So how do you, how do you do that? Yeah. So a great example is I had a goal of having 50 partnerships already confirmed by the end of summer. I was like, you know what? Uh, and honestly, we, we were going to launch Femme City Provence. We we're going to launch Femme City Madrid and Mallorca. We had everything. We were translating stuff, and trademarking things. And the pandemic was really great for us because it, we dived into like really what's, what it's going to take for us to launch in a Femme City Provence or Femme City uh, Paris. And the women over there were like, well, we don't really want marketing. You know, we really want to have classes on HR. Uh, and so I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not my speed at all. But that's what small businesses are are going through in Paris and in Provence. You know, they're dealing with HR issues. And so right. I, I realized that's not that's not the way we're going to scale. I mean, that's just not scalable for us. I can't create that curriculum in French and in Spanish and in German. And then having all sorts of different programs that are not geared towards small business, like marketing, branding, development, you know, scalability. Yeah, not to stuff. mention HR. I mean, HR varies by state. It definitely yeah. varies by country. I mean, we have con- um clients in Europe and they're like, oh yeah, no, France's labor laws is like a whole other yeah, fucking animal. Like yeah. <laughs> and, and I can't do it. And so having that, and so going, then pivoting and say, okay, if we're going to launch around the world, I need to figure out something else out. So this partnership situation has been perfect. We'll form partnerships. We'll help them to start their own chapters. We'll help in their own brand. We'll help them get things up and running, but then we'll partner up with them so that we can serve them. And so I came up with this goal. I think I should have 50 partnerships by the end of the summer. What does that look like? Backtracking. If I want to have 50 by, you know, August 31st, then how many do I have to bring to the table? And then you start. I already, so now I have 10 in like week number two. So now I have some sort of data to say, okay, if I got 10 in two weeks, how many more do I need to have? So it's, it's always like you look at the goal, the end goal, and then you backtrack to say, what do I need to do every single month leading to that with the data that I know to be accurate? And if you don't know, just start and you have data to at least work with to then figure out how those milestones are all going to lead up into those baby steps so that you can get to that goal. And I do that with everything. So if we want to be in 200 chapters or whatever it is, all right, great. How many do we have to start with now? How many weeks is that? What is what are, what are the action steps that we know that prove to bring in those results? That's the other thing. Like don't spend time and energy in areas that are not proven or do not work, or you've spent time doing it and it's like it's not showing up. Do the stuff that you know works um, from your own experience or from the experience of others that are doing very similar things and stay in that place. But um, I love data. I love reviewing numbers. I review it every single day to look like how we're doing in comparison to last month, in comparison to last year. So hovering around that area will always lead you to success because you are geared, you're on that path that's proven to work. So I, I'm already hearing that there's probably a lot of women, I used to be one of them, right? Who are be like, ooh, numbers. Oh, I'm scared mm. of numbers. Oh, the KPIs. Mm. Oh, the key performance indicators. Like I used to be one of those, like, I don't know what the fuck a KPI is. Like that was me three years ago, right? Like, <laughs> so it's all these new things that you have to learn. So what would you say to the women who have a weird relationship with numbers and data? I recently had Belinda Rosenblum of um, Cashflow CEO on the podcast. And we have this incredible conversation how sometimes people are afraid of looking at the numbers because they feel like it's judgment day. Mm. And they make the numbers mean a bunch of stuff. I've yeah. done it. I mean, yeah. I've done it. I will admit it, right? So what would you say to those women who are, who are just heard numbers and data and already cringed? Yeah. And that's a narrative I think that many women have picked up from childhood where someone along the way or somehow they felt like they weren't good at numbers. Like that there's me, some something me. that's what happened yeah. to me. Yeah. And so that's not true. Um, it's been proven that women are great with numbers. I just had Stephanie on our Instagram that you know her from the Femme City Global program, and she's a financial, you know, guru. And she it's proven women are great with numbers and women are great investors. And so if you are listening to this right now and you're scared of numbers, if you know two plus two, you are good. You are totally good. I'm telling you. I was that person also. I was like, I'm not good with numbers. I don't want to know the numbers. And Joan Barnes, who's my mentor, she's the founder of Jimbury. Um, she was like, one day she lectured me and she was like, you need to know your numbers. You need to know how much is going in, how much is going out. What are you spending dollars on? Uh, what activity is bringing the most money? You need to know it. And, and that is good for everyone. Everyone needs to know. You need to know your numbers and it might be horrible. You might have diarrhea. You might throw up and have diarrhea, whatever. But you need to know those numbers if you want to create a sustainable life. 
You just, that's just the way it is. And you are going to be good at it. And it's not scary. They are literally numbers. Um, I think that there is a societal weak a conditioning of women that they all feel that they're not good with numbers. They're not good with business. They're not, you know, all that stuff throw it out the window. It's not true. Someone told you that and it's fake. So just throw it out the window, literally. I love it. It's fake. Fake news. <laughs> it's fake, fake news. <laughs> just stop. No, just fake. It's like, it's not true. It's not true. Anyway. I was one of those girls, right? Where, and I don't think our school system really helps with this because for a lot of reasons, right? But I was one of those where like, I realized at the age of eight, I didn't do great on a math test. And it was it, I was done with numbers for like my yeah. entire academic career from the age of eight. And then they kept telling me, <laughs> oh, you're not good at this. You're much better at languages. So of course I had a whole mind fuck going on, yeah. right? Yeah. About me not being good at numbers. And I have to remind myself of that because um, like just last week I was reviewing some numbers and I was like avoiding it. And I'm like, okay, here's that fucking story about you not being good at math and you yeah. not being good at numbers, rearing its ugly head again, put on your big girl panties, look at these numbers. And then we found out, I found out, I was like, oh, we're doubling our revenue from last year. Why am I scared of this? <laughs> and it's right? always better, by the way, it's always better for the most part. Um, it, it generally, cause in our minds, we've created a monster. We've created this huge, huge monster. And then we look at it and we're like, oh my gosh, you know, my debt isn't as bad as I thought it was. Or it's not so scary to call that credit card company and say, Hey, can you lower your interest rate? Like it, it's not as bad as what we have really created in our minds. And again, these narratives were given to us by someone else who was not even in the game. There, there's no, they're not invested in our, in our today or in our future. You've given them power because you're, you're literally dictating your life based on some, some silly person told you, you know, but we all have that. All of the stories that we have that are self-limiting beliefs came from other people. That's One of those self-limiting beliefs, right? And I want to make sure we cover this because we are talking about, I mean, we're talking about helping a million people here. So let's talk about it, right? Fear of success. I've had, mm -hmm. had a lot of conversations with a lot of women recently who are like, I'm not afraid of failure. I have failed a million times, right? I have fear of success. Mm -hmm. So can you that. speak to, you had that. So can you speak to that and how you got over it? Cause I feel like that sometimes trips me up. Like I'm starting yeah. to get over it. Right. But I, I, I would say last year when I realized, like, when I have a moment where I sit and realize, holy shit, this is what you built. This is going to be multi millions of dollars coming your way. And I sit, cause I know what I have. I know yeah. what I've built. I know what I've created. And I sit there and then I get paralyzed. <laughs> sometimes right I don't so much anymore but that happened a few times in 2020 where it was like oh my god and then the magnitude of it sometimes just kind of like takes you out or even just earlier today we had someone new to subscribe and uh, come on to persuade to profit and she goes that's my thing I can't execute because I'm afraid of success hmm. so how, what is it how did you get over it because I'm hearing it with a lot of women recently I'm hearing that way more than fear of failure actually yeah. So it's like any injury, you have to find where that pain point is. Like if your knee, if you're hurting in your leg, you have to figure out like, where are my leg? Is it hurting? Is it my knee? Is it my ankle? Once you realize, I mean, that's great clarity. If someone already recognizes that they're scared of success, that's really powerful because you already diagnosed it. You already know that's what's happening. So you have to look back and say like, what is that story that you're saying to yourself when you have that thought? What is it? For me, it was, if I make a lot of money, uh, people won't like me or my husband will leave me. L literally that was, you know, if I make too Thank much money. Thank you for money, saying that. I think, I think more women need to talk about this, right? Because we do have this weird thing and I don't know why yeah. more people don't talk about it where it's like, oh, a guy's not going to like me if I make a lot of money or he's going to yeah. be off yeah. not offended. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, emasculated. Emasculated, right? He's going to be emasculated. Like we do have these like weird fucking stories in yeah. our heads about men leaving us if we make lots of money, which the more money I make, the better my picker gets. So I don't know where we got yeah, that from. I, I don't, right. yeah, I don't know where that story originated from. It may be multi-generational. It may be, I mean, I stopped watching TV. So maybe, you know, for me, it was, I just couldn't, couldn't keep watching women always depicted as like stealing each other's men or, you know, like, chasing after each other. I mean, I just couldn't do it anymore. So it could be a little bit of that as well. I, I think TV and movies dictate the way that we view each other in many ways. Um, but that's a common thing. That is a common thing that women feel like if I make so much money, my friends or my partner will leave me. I won't be popular anymore. 
you know, I, I will be, a lot of times people think success means that you're greedy. It means that you're shady because you only make tremendous wealth by screwing people over. So there are all these stories that we have that are circulating in our minds. But if you can dig in a little bit, which I did, for me, it was, if I make a lot of money, uh, Steve will not want to be married to me. And someone who's a mother figure in my life uh, will not like me anymore. So those were the two that I had. And so I sat there and I thought, okay, so let's say I do make a lot of money. What can I do with that? Well, I could provide more for my family. I can definitely afford the tuition of all these expensive schools they all want to go to. I can provide vacations for them. I can give to charities. How does that feel? Gosh, that feels really good. That feels amazing. Yeah, right? So someone, you're going to give power to someone who might take all that away from you because you're capable of all that. That's what you're really saying. You're giving that person power. And at the end of the day, you know, and Steve and I did divorce and then we got back together. Now we're married, which is a whole other story, but great story, um, by the way, <laughs> great story, but that's, it's okay. It's okay to figure out what that story is. that's holding you back, saying it to yourself and going, well, that's stupid. That's really silly. You know, I do want to give more to charities. I do want to go ahead and give my, my kids vacations or my loved ones. I do want to buy that Tesla or whatever it is that will make me join. So if that, if all of that, that I want is wrong, and this person's going to judge me for that, does that person need to be in my life? I mean, is that really what I'm saying now? So just having those conversations with yourself over and over again, as soon as you find that trigger, as soon as you have that reaction where it's like, oh, can't do that because I'm going to be successful. Oh, you know, like, oh, that opportunity, that might be the one It's going to push me over to that up level. As soon as you have that little, and you know it, stop everything and think about where did that thought come from? How was it given to you? Repeating it to yourself, saying what you're giving up in order to keep that narrative. What are you giving up? You're probably giving up a, a beautiful life of doing what you want to do, feel the purpose, feel the intention, making the world a better place because of this ridiculous narrative that someone along the way gave to you unintentionally, perhaps. So, um, and that happens all the time. And when you remove one self limiting belief, you will most likely uncover 20 others. <laughs> so it's, it's like a it's game a, of whack-a-mole. It's a game. Yeah, it's like an onion. It's a game. And so, yeah. And so, but there are many, many, many of us that have that, had it, still have it, whatever. Um, and, and it's an evolution. Eventually you won't even have a thought about it because you'll start making money and you'll be like, you know what? I'm still a really good person. I'm still doing really great work in this world. I still have a lot of beautiful love around me. And if that person, it makes them feel uncomfortable that I'm shining so bright, you know, it is what it is. Don't dim your light for anyone. Don't play small. You are not, I, I use that example. Anything watered down is horrible. Watered down wine, watered down coffee, watered down chocolate. Like everything that's watered down is horrible. And that includes humans also. When we're watered down, we play mediocre selectively and intentionally. We're damaging those around us because we could be shining our light and, and really impacting the lives of so many more if we would just step into that place. So what I'm hearing you say is number one, self-love and number two, boundaries, right? Yep. Meaning like boundaries. Women yeah. struggle notoriously with boundaries. Obviously, if we're scaling a company to a million people, if we are making lots of money, guess what? Guess what I've learned? Y'all need to, you need to have some strong ass boundaries yep. <laughs> in yeah. order to do that. So can you speak to that? Because I feel like for me as a woman, and I don't know if you've experienced that as well, there comes times where I have to reevaluate and reinstate boundaries. And if I'm not careful, they will start getting loose, right? And then I start giving too many shits what other people think about me. And then my behavior starts changing. Mm -hmm. I've become very mm -hmm. aware of it. But I have found that that is an area, and there's a lot of statistics to back this up as well, where women really struggle with the boundary thing. So because they struggle with the boundary, they're doing the lion's share of not only working, they're also doing the lion's share of um, housework, mm -hmm. right? Like you got a partner, ask them to do some shit or just say no, right? Or they don't have boundaries with their kids or they don't have boundaries with their friends or they don't have boundaries with their family. And then that is directly correlated to the amount of wealth that they have. So how have you, what has been your journey with boundaries, right? And what can women do to kind of get more comfortable with it? Cause I think it's societal conditioning. We've been told, be the nice girl, be nice. Yep. Don't be a bitch. Right. Yep. You know, um, and instead of being a bitch, just bend over backwards for everybody else. So they like you. So what is your journey with that been as you scale and as you have these big visions? Cause I'm sure you need to have them if you're yeah. going to go that big. Yeah. So I, 
um, years and years and years ago, when I first started Femme City, I got, I started getting really sick because I was putting in ridiculous amount of hours. I thought that being a founder meant that you had to work until you collapsed, that that was the true definition of a, a woman who's empowered and a woman who's really like, you know, keeping up and just pushing it to limits. And I just had all these ridiculous, stupid things. And so I started getting really sick, I started getting like, you know, I was diagnosed pre-diabetic. I started having anxiety. I started having high blood pressure. I mean, I was just a disaster. And my doctor at the time, I had a Blackberry, <laughs> how long ago it was, I had a Blackberry and he took my Blackberry away, left me in the, um, in the little doctor's office, you know, patient room, turned off the light, closed the door and left me in there for like 10 minutes, came back, but I thought he had lost his mind, took my phone also, I was like, how do you take my phone? Like, how am I going to live? How am I going to breathe? But my blood pressure went down. And so he was like, you need to start saying no. You need to just really start getting control of your life because you're going to die. The way you're going, you're going to die. I sat on the, on six different boards at the time. I was running Femme City. I remember time. that. I had my, yep. yeah, it was crazy. And so I started saying no. And here's the thing. When I started saying no, it felt bad. I felt horrible. I felt like these people counted on me. And I was like, you know what? I can still donate money to these charities. I can still drive money in their direction. I don't have to sit on a board to do that. Once I started doing that, I started getting healthier. I started realizing like how beautiful it is to say no. Then I started working on my family structure. Like, okay, I need to kind of get that. Talk about streamline process. You know, like how do I get that to be its most efficient state? You know, carpool. Oh, Violet has three be- kids. We forgot to mention yeah. that part, So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lots they of people. Three kids <laughs> and three different schools at like all different times. It was crazy. So trying to get that to be as efficient as possible, leveraging friends, leveraging people to pick up, drop off. That really helped as well. And creating then those boundaries with personal relationships. And the truth is that I probably lost a couple of friendships along the way. Because when you start saying no, other people either recognize it as a place of power and strength, and you will inspire them to also do the same, which is really important to say that, no, hey, no, I can't commit to that. It doesn't align with my vision. Saying no to that, this doesn't align with the time that I have you know, currently, but thanks for thinking of me. Or no, thanks, but you know what? I know someone who can help you. So there are ways you can say no with grace and love, but still say no. But once you start saying no, some people will either be upset because you can't share that time with them anymore, or they'll recognize like how beautiful that is that you've said no, and they will also start saying no in their life as well. That becomes, it's almost like, it's not that it's an addiction to say no, but it becomes so liberating to say no to activities, to opportunities that are not in alignment, that cannot fill up your schedule. Because if you're doing all that, you can't focus on the wealth. You can't focus on your bigger vision. That was the way I did it. I did it in like baby steps, in chunks. You clear up more and more time. And then all of a sudden, I mean, then saying no is actually really enjoyable. Saying no all the time, you know, can I pick your brain for free? No, but here's a link to hire me if you need, you know, if you need a coaching session. Hey, can you do this for free? You know, so you start getting really comfortable in that space. Once you start saying no, and once you start coming up with the words that you can actually address it from a point of love, which I think is where a lot of women feel, if I say no, they won't like me. If I say no, I'll be looked, you know, frowned upon, but you can say no with a lot of love. And, you know, at the end of the day, they either receive that love or they reject it, but you have, you have given as much love as you can to that, to that. No, <laughs> does that make yeah, sense? So- so in Persuade to Profit, uh, one of the favorite lessons that the women love, and, and I don't, I've never seen a sales training break this down, but I know that for us, the people pleasing thing is an issue, right? Um, and it really messes us up with sales and, and money and all, and just running a business in general and just life. <laughs> it messes us yeah. up with life. Yeah. So actually one of the lessons we have in Persuade to Profit, and it actually really helps them with sales right? Is the difference between being passive, being assertive and being aggressive because Mm. women confuse assertiveness with aggressiveness Mm. and then they become passive. And then when you become passive, you stay broke and miserable and anxious and tired. Yep. And and almost dead like me. I was literally like, because everyone's like, Hey, will you be on this board? Sure. Can you chair this? Sure. Can you raise this? Sure. Like, you know, can you, can you take the kids to all these three different schools? Okay. Like it was literally, that was my life. Cause, and I, by the way, I was good at it too. I was good at doing everything, which also got me all excited when people were like, finally, we don't know Validation. how to do it. Yeah. You're amazing. Yeah. Like you're the super mom. How do you do it? We always ask. And so that became its own like title. Like, wow. You know, like I, and that it's horrible. Cause it's setting also the expectation that everybody else has to perform at that level, which is unhealthy 
and not sustainable. So that's a whole other, uh, yeah, kind of reason why we should be saying no and sticking to it. Say no. Yes. Say no. I have to remind myself all the time, but you're right. It is, it is a wonder. And as it grows and as it scales, it's like, Oh, new boundaries. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh. New boundaries. New, and new not rules of engagement. Yep, and not everybody gets it. And some people get pissed too bad. Yep, All right. So Fem City always has a lot going on. You've got events going on every week. You mentioned recently that in-person events are starting to come back. Thank God. I've yes. missed being around I people. Know. Me too. Yeah, we have them all. So hopefully you can join us in July uh, or our next one, whenever you, know, you can make it. We'd love to have you there. But yes, um, in real life events, we're starting to do that. And we have a Fem City summer camp for girls. We're looking at encouraging and inspiring young girls to become future entrepreneurs. So we have that coming up. It's a two-week uh, module, totally free. Um, it'll be on femcitygirls.com when we launch it later on this month, but that's what we have going on. We're lots, lots of good stuff. Yeah. And then everybody will have links to Fem City, everything, all the events, all the different cities. It's not just, are the other cities opening up too for the in-person events or is it just Miami right now? Pretty much everything except for Canada. Canada still, yeah. I had a meeting with our director there. They're just starting to open up at 15% capacity. I think they're going to open in two weeks for 25% capacity. So the Canadian chapters are still uh, virtual, but for the U.S., <laughs> It's all open. <laughs> it's like all everything so else. crazy. Yeah. So crazy. We Actually, you know what? I think I, I think this is a really good question. Um, just because of what we went through, and then we'll end it there since it just came up. Like you had a lot of in-person stuff going on before the pandemic. Yeah. There were events <laughs> all the time. There are retreats where people had to travel. <laughs> like you had to change a lot of shit, right? <laughs> because of 2020. Can you briefly walk us through that? Right. Because I feel like 2020 has some of the best entrepreneurial stories that we're ever going to hear. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, so I was going to Equinox. This is like, this is my, when they say, where were you when you heard, like, what were you doing? This is what I was doing. So I was at Equinox and there's a Sephora down the hall from it. I had just done my class and it was empty. There was no one there. It was already apocalyptic. And, um, I walked into Sephora to get the cover up for under my eyes because I have dark circles. And I knew I was gonna be doing a lot of video. I was like, oh, this means I'm gonna be doing a lot of video. So I walked in to get the under eye thing because I was thinking everything's gonna shut down for, I don't know how long, I just need to have the cover up. And the ladies at Sephora were talking in Spanish about how they had heard about the first case in Miami. And oh my gosh, the first case made it to Miami. So I'm listening to them, I bought my little cover up thing. I get into my car and I literally cried from my car <laughs> to my house. Cause I was like, oh my God, it is, it's now officially real. I got back, I looked at my calendar and we were, we had at that time, 200 in-person events Oh my God. in that month. We had a conference that we had scheduled in Philadelphia, Toronto, South Texas, Miami, and I think Des Moines, maybe it was Chicago, somewhere in the Midwest and had to cancel all that. I had to get all the money back also, had to refund all the money. It was so crazy. I don't think I slept. And then we had to shift everything to online, train our entire team. We had a lot of team members that didn't even know how to get on zoom. We had to figure out how to make it so that they could get on zoom. I mean, it was, I, it was like three weeks of just insanity. And then we started giving out away memberships. We started a scholarship program because we started getting, we lost so many members because they, they, everyone canceled. They were like, we can't afford this anymore. You know, my, right. I just, my husband got let go or my kids, I've got to homeschool my kids now. And so we started doing scholarships. We started giving away memberships to women that couldn't afford it anymore. And we kind of stepped into that place. We started doing a lot more of mental health summits. We had women that were like, I need mental health help. You got to have someone here. So we did that series. Um, we did a series on racism. That was a whole other thing too. We stepped into that place and had soulful conversations about racism and getting perspectives of other people. And it was, it was a year of shifting from just not being business talk, but just talking about everything that mattered to those that were around us and stepping into that place, which was so new and foreign to us. Um, it was really great. I think uh, more friendships developed from that. We, I have more of a profound relationship with all of our members. I know them all. I mean, there's thousands. Um, it was really, it was great, but I just sat down like last week and had a glass of wine and finally just started breathing. Cause I was like, we made it. So now every time I see people like we made everyone, we made it through, like all of us, congratulations. We made it through. I can't, it's just unbelievable. What a it's ride. That's, that's a hell of a story. And you know what? I keep saying that because 
I mean, ours wasn't as dramatic, but we did have clients who like their whole businesses were shut down overnight. We lost a massive contract, right. That we had just signed. We lost it. Um, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, lots of fires to put out. I think everybody had fires to put out. Everyone, everyone did. Right. And then, and then, um, we were stuck at home. So it was a lot of infrastructure. It was a lot of systems. It was a lot of, I don't think I've ever worked so hard in my life and a lot of shifts and a lot of different things that were coming up as a result of the pandemic. So part of the reason why we added six modules of sales training to persuade to profit was because people were begging us for it because they were like, we need to make money. Like we need, like, we don't know how to deal with all the uncertainty in the marketplace right now. Like, how do you talk to people about money with the uncertainty in the marketplace right now? People were knocking down our door for it. I don't think I've ever worked harder in my life, but it was similar. I feel like it wasn't until recently where, like, I think it was on Tuesday where I just sat there and I was like, (laughs) we made it. And I'm really proud of us because this is better than what I had even had in my mind, but shit was that difficult to go through. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. I had on our podcast, this woman who, um, she's a beautiful designer and I, it's uh, the name of it. Oh my gosh, uh, Dune, Dune, Dune Jewelry. She actually makes beautiful um, jewelry with sand from different parts of the world, from different beaches. Just beautiful. I love her. Her energy is amazing. And I had her on the podcast we were talking about, it was during the, the hot heat of the pandemic. And she said something like, her product was sold in 9,000 stores and they all shut down. And I was like, Oh my, I mean, it was just like the wind. It was just, she said it was brutal, brutal because it was just overnight. Just like you said, it was overnight. She had all these contracts, new retail stores, she had partnerships and everything just shut down. And I mean, 9,000, that's insane, but she's still here. She's still, you know, she's probably doing the same thing. We We made made it. it. (laughs) We we all earned our stripes, right? And I told my team, I'm like, listen, if anybody made it through 2020, like whatever, anything else is going to be easy. I don't like, because I don't think we're seeing a disruption like this again in our lifetimes. Yeah, we're acclimated now. We're acclimated. We're 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 acclimated. I'm like, I'm waiting for the aliens to show up. Like, I'm just like, whatever. Like, I don't. They're not showing up for a while. They're like, let's just see how this all settles. (laughs) Let's see how this all, like, I'm ready. I'm prepared. Like, I'm just, I'm not even like concerned. And I'm like, well, whatever yeah. fucking craziness like comes out yeah. and at me, yeah. like we earned our stripes. We got it. Yeah, well, thank totally. you. Bye. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom. We will have links to everything. And until next time, guys, cheers to making money, your honey, and go be the queen of your sales. My team and I have been getting asked a lot of questions about how you can work with us. We get messages all the time like, oh my gosh, your content is so great. You know, how do I get started working with you? How do I improve the sales in my business? How do I get this rocking and rolling? Which is a great question. You're already in the right place, which is by checking out our YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell because we have new videos coming out every single week. If you want to kick it up a notch, the second thing you can do is check out our media pitch 365 system. Uh, We've had lots of people start here and basically what that does is that it teaches you how to get more media attention and it also gives you 365 different ideas you can use to pitch the media. We have 365 ideas for relationship coaches, 365 ideas for financial coaches. Uh, We also have ideas for career coaches, uh, life coaches, you name it, we've got it in this product so we will put the information on how to get that above and below and then finally if you really want to get this going you really want to get it done right you need help with really narrowing down who your audience is really creating a spectacular signature offer that's easy to sell and you want to make sure that you're getting the exact sales training that you need in order to get money in the door quickly then come join us in persuade to profit you can apply to work with us in that program and the information will be below and we'll also have it up here.